my name is Sandra. Welcome to AXA, everyone. Yeah. This is our second presentation, and uh, we just love doing these presentations. So we've got a really special guest today with us. But first of all, I'd like to um, do a little bit of an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm on Yinnabara country today, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, but also to really connect us to the land that we're on and just think about the fact that we are going to, to be talking about today uh, your own connection to the land and how you can uh, strengthen that connection. So a little bit about AXA, so Australian Citizen Science Association. It's a member-based um, incorporated association and basically we advocate um, for citizen science, which is people engaging, the public engaging in science and having also scientists on board to look at your data that you collect. And you can do that in any capacity really, um, as long as it's being uh, towards, uh, you know, increasing the knowledge um, that we have scientifically, um, collaborating basically with scientists. And really this is what this presentation is particularly about in terms of how this can be done through one of the largest citizen science uh, initiatives, which is iNaturalist. And I do wonder how many of you are already using it. I'm super excited about it. I'm super excited about introducing our speaker, Thomas Massaglio, who's doing his PhD uh, at University of New South Wales. And he is, I think, are you Beachcomber? You're going to get to introduce yourself as well. But you might know um, Thomas as Beachcomber on iNaturalist. Uh, he's doing his research on um, species discovery and knowledge of Australian plants and uh, answering various questions, actually using the data that's being supplied to iNaturalist. So that would be super uh, cool to hear about that later, Thomas, as well. Um, and he's also the curator on iNaturalist and a moderator of the forum and also runs several bio blitzes throughout the year. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I will hand over to you in a second. I just want to forget to talk about um, our housekeeping, <laughs> which is uh, basically for all of us to be muted, uh, just so we can let Thomas speak and we can all hear him properly. And also uh, we'll be sending out a little survey, which will take about a minute to complete at the end. We really appreciate it if you would do the survey because it gives us understanding of what you guys um, want to hear about in the future and also just everything sort of um, related to like your interests so we can make these presentations better. And it only takes a couple of minutes, I think, at the most. So um, I do one every time. So it's really cool to, um, to engage those surveys. So thanks so much. Without further ado, welcome, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I apologize in advance if I start to lose my voice. I've had a very jam-packed week full of iNaturalist presentations uh, to a lot of groups. Uh, so as Sandra mentioned, if anyone that already uses iNaturalist, I'm the beachcomber uh, on the platform. And for anyone that has ever been to any of my other workshops or talks, uh, you'll know that typically I tend to use iNaturalist Live uh, and run people through functionality and how to do certain things. But because for this particular talk, I know there's probably a decent mix of people who have and, and haven't used iNaturalist, uh, I've gone for a little bit of a different approach and, and more of a, a holistic overview of iNaturalist. So I'll briefly talk about what iNaturalist actually is and how it works. Uh, I'll delve into some statistics for Australia specifically. Uh, so I apologize to any of our uh, people tuning in from Africa or, or further abroad, there is a bit of a, an Australian flavor tonight. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch on some significant projects that people might be interested in joining on iNaturalist. Uh, and then I'll look at two pieces of research where I've actually used data from iNaturalist uh, in my own work. So what is iNaturalist? So it is an online biodiversity citizen science platform. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the basic currency of iNaturalist is observations. And basically what an observation is, simple definition, it's any interaction between yourself and observer and any living organism at a point in time. Now, typically these observations take the form of photographs, uh, but you can also upload sound recordings to iNaturalist. So if you happen to hear a frog or a cicada or a bird and you didn't manage to get a photo, uh, you're still able to take a recording and upload that to iNaturalist and that's perfectly okay. So then once you've uploaded your photograph or your sound recording to iNaturalist, then you get to possibly the most exciting part, which is where it gets identified for you. Now, of course, if you already know what you observed, then you're able to add an identification yourself and other people can confirm it for you. 
But let's say that you have no idea what you've seen. Uh, you've seen this insect, you know that it's, it's some kind of bug, but you really have no clue beyond that. This is where the power of the iNaturalist community comes into play. And really perhaps the most significant part about the iNaturalist community is that it's a global one and that you have researchers, museum curators, scientists, literally world experts in their field across the entire planet in every group of organisms that you can imagine uh, that use iNaturalist and can help out with identifications. So even if you aren't that interested in uploading photos yourself uh, or making observations, but you still want to contribute to iNaturalist, uh, then by all means, you know, you're very, very welcome to contribute identifications yourself as well. And then perhaps, at least from my perspective, one of the most gratifying parts of iNaturalist is that once observations have been uploaded uh, and identified, then those records actually get exported to external databases. So from an Australian perspective, perhaps the most important of these is the Atlas of Living Australia. So this is basically Australia's biggest biodiversity data aggregator. And essentially what it does is it collects biodiversity records from all kinds of different sources. So other citizen science platforms like uh, eBird or Frog ID, uh, government sources like Bionet, uh, you can contribute to the Atlas of Living Australia as an individual. Uh, and of course, all the iNaturalist records from Australia all get pumped into the Atlas of Living Australia. And then on top of that, a subset of those records also get sent to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility which is basically just like the global version of the ALA. And the reason that these two databases is, are so important is that these pretty much provide the basis and the foundation of our knowledge of species distributions. So you can go into the, the ALA or GBIF and you can look up any species and then you can understand exactly where that species is distributed. And you can basically query any individual record and find out more details like when that record was actually made, uh, who was the observer, uh, what kind of habitat that, that species was in, and all kinds of amazing information that is very, very regularly used in real world research. And that's one of the most amazing things about iNaturalist is not only can you build up your own personal life list, not only can you both have other people identify records for you, but also identify records for others, but your records can actually become uh, real world data uh, being used in meaningful research by actual scientists. And I always find that a really, really cool thing. So just to give a very brief insight into the incredible magnitude of iNaturalist and just the epic scale ac across the globe, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, iNaturalist hit 100 million observations submitted to the platform. So these cover almost 400,000 different species observed by more than 2.2 million observers. So over the past uh, five years in particular, iNaturalist has just seen this incredible exponential growth in, in all of these metrics. Uh, so there is certainly no better time to jump on board if you haven't already. Now, from an Australian perspective, uh, I, I think I can say that we certainly punch above our weight. So this is just a, a brief table showing the top six contributing nations across the globe uh, in order of number of observations. Now you can see obviously the US is well out in front. Uh, they've got a much bigger population. iNaturalist was largely founded in the US in California. Uh, and so you've, you've basically got a lot more people that have been contributing for a lot longer time. But the, just the two numbers I briefly wanted to point out here for Australia, and I'll just turn on my uh, pen. Uh, is these two in particular, so species and average number of observations per observer. And these are the ones where we're really punching above our weight. So you can see that despite Mexico and Canada having, uh, and indeed Canada having more than double the amount of observations uh, and Mexico having more than 400,000 observations more than us, we actually have far more species that we've observed. And then when you look at the average number of observations per observer, you see we absolutely knock all the other countries out of the park, except for South Africa, who are perennially impressive. Uh, but we can certainly say that when it comes to individual observers for Australia, uh, each individual person is actually contributing more observations than even the US and Canada and Mexico. Now, this is a really cool graph that I like to show people when I talk about iNaturalist. And what this is showing is the number of observations being submitted for Australia per month. Now you can see if you go back to 2008, when iNaturalist first started, it was pretty much nothing, right? There was nothing getting uploaded for Australia. And it actually wasn't until you can see around 
mid to the early to mid 2011 that even a single record got submitted for Australia. Then you have about five years of basically stagnant uploads where you may have something like 10 to 50 observations being uploaded per month, uh, but nothing really exciting happening. But then you get to around mid-2016 and you have this quite significant jump when you compare it to the rest of the years. And I'll talk about this jump a little bit later. But then when we look at all these other really big jumps, we have this one in 2019. So this is when Bowerbird uh, collapsed. So Bowerbird used to be kind of the premier uh, biodiversity citizen science platform for Australia. Uh, it then collapsed and most of the records were migrated across to iNaturalist. So that was this big spike. Then you have the first time that Australia participates in the City Nature Challenge. Then you have the first time Australia participates in the Great Southern Bio Blitz. And in particular, this spike is quite noticeable uh, and notable uh, because this is the first time that the number of observations uploaded in a single month for Australia exceeded 100,000, which is incredibly impressive. Then this spike here is the second time we participated in the City Nature Challenge. And then this absolutely amazing spike at the top with over 175,000 observations submitted in a single month is the second year of the Great Southern Bio Blitz, uh, which is a really amazing testament uh, to the incredible uh, advertising and promotion done by uh, Michelle uh, and, and Stephen Fricker and, and a whole lot of other amazing people that are part of the team uh, in really driving participation right across the Southern Hemisphere. And then with this little spike here, this is the third City Nature Challenge that happened earlier this year. Uh, so I can, I'm very much anticipating what the third Great Southern Bio Blitz spike is going to look like. And perhaps even we might exceed 200,000 observations in one month for the first time. This is just a, a very brief, brief glimpse at a heat map uh, showing where observations are distributed across Australia. Uh, it's not too surprising, as you can imagine, most of the hotspots, which are in red, are clustered around capital cities uh, and population centres. Although the one reason I like to show this figure is that, in fact, some of these hotspots are actually just driven by individual users. Uh, so, for example, this hotspot just around here is Coffs Harbour, and this is actually driven almost entirely by one user. So for anyone who uses iNaturalist, you might recognise the name Nick Lambert. He is a fantastic, uh, amazing naturalist. And he has over 60,000 observations that he has contributed just by himself. So if you're, if you're looking to fill out some gaps, make sure you go to some of these places that uh, aren't in red. And one, one thing I also like to look at, I also always like to check out some taxonomic biases that exist on iNaturalist and how people have certain uh, tendencies to record some organisms more than others. So, Moths and butterflies are a really big thing, not just uh, in Australia for iNaturalist, but also iNaturalist broadly. And so I, I know that quite a few people in this call have, have done moth nights. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what they are and, and haven't done them before, I highly recommend them. Basically, you get yourself a white sheet or a mosquito net uh, and you hang it vertically outside at nighttime. And then you set up uh, some kind of light source, whether a, a, norm, a standard lamp or a UV light. And then you get all kinds of amazing moths and insects flocking in, and then you're able to take photos of those really easily. So for Australia and iNaturalist, there are about 520, 530,000 observations of moths and butterflies. And if you take all of those observations, they're actually roughly equivalent to, and in fact, they're probably a little bit more than, all the frogs and toads, all the reptiles, all the fishes, and all the fungi combined. So definitely when you look at Australian observations, there's a very strong moth flavour. And indeed, what I find to be an even more incredible bias is that if you get all of the observations just of magpies, just a single species, so this is, so magpies are actually the most observed uh, species for Australia. If you take all of the magpie observations, they actually outweigh all the observations for, for these five phyla combined. So, that, so a magpie is just a single species. And all of these tacks are on the right-hand side, our entire phyla, and yet the number of observations are equivalent. What I'll do next is I thought I'd delve a little bit into projects. So for people who are unaware about projects, projects are basically a substructure that exists within the broader platform of iNaturalist. And they're a really great way for collating observations together that have some kind of unifying theme. So this theme can be taxonomic, uh, it can be geographic, uh, it can be combinations of the two. It can be based on certain dates or times, 
or it can be based on some kind of other uh, metadata, things like a life history uh, stage. So for example, you could have a project that's just caterpillars uh, or you could have projects based on sex. So you could have just projects of uh, male birds or just projects of female birds. And, and as I mentioned, that they're just a really great way of organizing observations into a single place uh, and allow you to see them easily at the same time. They're also a really, really great way of fostering a community that is all interested in this one unifying theme. And perhaps the best example uh, of an Australian project is Australasian fishes. Now, if we go all the way back to this graph, I mentioned that I was gonna talk about this little jump here in 2016. So this jump is when Australasian fishes was first started. And it was really one of the first uh, driving factors behind the popularity of iNaturalist from an Australian perspective. So this project was created by Mark McGrath, the former curator of fishes at the Australian Museum, uh, an amazing, amazing naturalist. And over the course of the last six years, he has single-handedly brought together this incredible community that basically consists of not only all these amazing divers and fishermen and, and scuba uh, divers and snorkelers uh, and beachcombers that, that are observing fishes, uh, but also this incredible array of experts that are able to provide identifications for other users. You can pretty much pick any major institution uh, or museum in the entirety of Australia and the fishes curator from each of those museums uh, and organizations is on iNaturalist and an active identifier for this project, as well as many, many taxonomic experts across Australia, uh, as well as overseas experts that have expertise in Australian groups of fishes. So you just have this incredible situation where you can observe a fish or shark or ray from anywhere in Australia or New Zealand and upload it to the project and you're almost guaranteed that it's going to get identified for you. And as you can see, it's pretty much one of the biggest projects in Australia with over 175,000 observations of fishes, sharks and rays across getting close to three and a half thousand species and particularly impressively being contributed to by more than 5,000 people. Uh, on top of this, there are many, many amazing records from this project, uh, something in the vicinity of seven to 800 uh, that are scientifically valuable and interesting records. So all kinds of new things like uh, previously undiscovered and undescribed species being uploaded to the platform uh, and then ending up being described. Uh, things like new ecological interactions, new observations of uh, predator-prey relationships, uh, parasite relationships, new behaviors, uh, many, many range extensions. Uh, so the other really cool thing about projects in general and particularly Australasian fishes uh, is that uh, a couple of times a month, there's a journal post uh, that is written up by Harry Rosenthal. Uh, you can see him uh, here. And a couple of times a month, uh, the project will put a, a spotlight on a significant user and, and put a, a really nice profile up about them and talk about their history and their contributions to the project or sometimes Mark will highlight a really significant observation. And it's just, as I mentioned, fostered this really incredible sense of community within iNaturalist. Another really cool one that some of you may have encountered, and I think this is one of the more important uh, projects on iNaturalist from an Australian perspective, is the Roadkill Project. So if you uh, encounter Roadkill uh, anywhere in Australia, you can upload it to this project and then you'll be prompted to add additional information with your sighting. So this includes things like the speed limit of the road, uh, what the roadside habitat was, uh, how fresh the kill was, and if the observation was of a marsupial, uh, whether it had pouch young or not. Uh, and this is just building up this really, really valuable data set that will, uh, on the one hand, in many areas, uh, hopefully contribute to local government and local councils uh, installing things like protective barriers that will help reduce roadkill in those areas. Uh, and in fact, in Victoria, this has already happened. So this project was started by uh, Tricia Stewart, uh, you can see here, and she's from Victoria. And in fact, the one area in Victoria where there were a number of dandicoots uh, being regularly killed uh, and, and observed as roadkill uh, in Australia, uh, because of the buildup of observations on this project, the local council actually installed protective guardrails that have now reduced the number of bandicoot deaths on the roads. So that's a, a, a really, really cool application uh, and a, an immediate application of iNaturalist data. A great one, uh, doesn't really have many uh, scientific purposes at the moment per se, but I'm sure many will be found in the future. 
But at the moment, a really great one from a personal identification perspective is the Found Feathers Project. If you find any feather uh, on your travels and you upload it to this project, it is very, very high chances that it will get identified for you, which I always find amazing, especially the, the obscure brown and gray and brown uh, black feathers that I find that I couldn't imagine would ever be identified to species, but they inevitably do. Uh, particularly uh, this user, Caracaxa, uh, she's a, a young girl from Greece and she is an incredible naturalist and can identify pretty much any feather <laughs> anywhere in the world, as well as feather enthusiast who's from the US and she is equally incredible. You've got the Hungry Parrots Project, which is another really cool Australian specific one. And basically if you see any kind of lorikeet, cockatoo, galah, any kind of parrot uh, feeding on seeds, fruits, grasses, you can upload it to the project uh, and you can add an additional bit of metadata saying what it was feeding on. Uh, and this is a contributing to a real life uh, research project. So another, another case where you are able to contribute to meaningful research. And finally, uh, a more recently created project uh, is Australian Gauls. So for anyone that is familiar with Gauls, you'll know that they're caused by a really amazing diversity of different organisms across many different taxa. So this includes things like fungi, scale insects, wasps, flies, you name it. And so because they are so diverse from a taxonomic perspective, if you are interested in Gauls, it can be really difficult to search for all these different taxa at the same time. And so why this project is so great is that it just uses the annotation goal. So if you do upload a photo of a goal, make sure you add the annotation goal under uh, evidence of presence, uh, and it will automatically be collected into the project. And then for some of the experts that are familiar with goals and are able to identify them, it just puts them all into the one easy, convenient, uh, searchable place uh, for them to identify them. So this is kind of one of those projects that just, uh, in a sense, facilitates easier identification by experts. So with just checking the roughly 15 minutes or so uh, that I've got left, I'll try and jam pack in uh, a couple of uh, pieces of research that uh, I've been involved with. So as I've mentioned multiple times now, uh, iNaturalist data is being used every single day, uh, and I say that without exaggeration, uh, in all kinds of amazing research from around the entire globe. So this includes all kinds of things from uh, describing new species uh, to uh, describing eco new ecological interactions, uh, large scale ecological studies looking at uh, the influence of natural disasters like bushfires or things like climate change, and global warming, uh, looking at things like character traits. So things like uh, color uh, or size or shape and how these things may change over a latitudinal or a temporal gradient. Uh, and all kinds of uh, theoretical frameworks are springing up as well, which include things like how to improve observations on iNaturalist and how to get people going out there and observing more and creating better data and higher quality observations. I've done a lot of research using iNaturalist data, both data that I've collected myself, uh, as well as using data collected by other users. Um, I've published somewhere in the vicinity of eight to nine scientific papers now using iNaturalist data. Uh, ranging all the way from a single data point to literally millions of data points. Uh, the two that I'll delve into tonight, one is about species discovery and one is about ecosystem recovery. So the first one is just a really cool example that I like to highlight because it, it really hammers home the importance of experts on iNaturalist and also the uh, amazing changes that we have seen in the ability to identify observations compared to say five, 10 or 20 years ago. So this is a, a small silverfish uh, that I found when I was doing a survey in a little 20 hectare reserve near my house. Uh, the reserve is this vegetation type called Cook's River Clay Plain Scrub Forest. It's a critically endangered vegetation type for which there's only about 1% left Here. after having been uh, drastically cleared uh, across Sydney. It, it had there'd been a lot of very heavy rain uh, in March of last year. It had driven a lot of insects and other arthropods that are typically found in the soil to the surface. So I was out and about hunting for interesting insects and spiders and millipedes. And I found this really cool looking uh, silverfish that I didn't recognize. So I uploaded it to iNaturalist just with the identification silverfish because I had no idea what it was. And Nicola Susik came along and identified it as the family Nicoletidae. So he is an Austrian entomologist and he specializes in groups, uh, a lot of the more primitive insect groups like silverfishes, as well as other taxa like millipedes. 
Uh, and he said it was a great find. Uh, and so I thought, well, I, I might look into this a bit further and see if I can narrow this thing down. Uh, and as I mentioned, this really just emphasizes the fact that I'm in Sydney. I have uploaded a photo of an insect that I found and within 24 hours, you have someone literally on the other side of the planet uh, able to offer an identification for me. Uh, whereas in the past, if I wanted an expert from Austria or from the US or from Southeast Asia or from Africa uh, to look at something like this, I probably would have had to get a specimen, uh, mail it to them. That might have taken several weeks. They had to take a look at it. Then they have to correspond back with me. And by the time the whole process is done, this could have taken weeks or even potentially months. But now you can have literally someone on the other side of the globe uh, respond to your observation and offer up an identification in, in literally a matter of minutes. So now that I knew what family it was, I went into the Australian Faunal Directory and I looked up the family and I found that the compiler and the expert is Graham Smith, who was from the Australian Museum. So I looked him up and I found that he's still quite an active taxonomist. He's still publishing. So I emailed him and he said, well, this looks like an undescribed species to me. Uh, would you be able to collect a specimen? So I went back to the reserve a couple of days later. I was lucky enough to find another one, uh, collected a specimen into ethanol. I posted that to him. And within the course of less than a year, uh, we were able to publish uh, a paper uh, and I was lucky enough to be a co-author on it. And that silverfish was described as a new species. So without iNaturalist, uh, this species may, may never have been recognized and who knows how long it would have been before it was described uh, and discovered if potentially ever again. Uh, because the really cool thing about this silverfish uh, is that this is actually a species in a genus that has previously only been found in caves uh, and only in areas that are fairly remote in New South Wales. Whereas I found this record just in, in a tiny little urban reserve, almost in the heart of Western Sydney. Uh, so it really just shows uh, the importance of it doesn't matter if you think something is really common or if you think it's a bad photo or if it's it's something that won't turn out to be interesting. Always, always upload the photos to iNaturalist and you never know what it might turn out to be because I certainly did not expect this to turn out to be an undescribed species. But from a, a bigger data perspective uh, and a project uh, that I've been working on for a number of years now is one relating to ecosystem recovery. So as everyone would remember well, back in the 2019-2020 bushfire season, uh, Australia was absolutely torched. Uh, and in particular, New South Wales was very badly affected with literally millions upon millions of hectares of land burnt across the state. But the problem with that is that scientists can't be everywhere at the same time. So this is obviously a, a tremendous tragedy, both from a human perspective and from a biodiversity perspective. Uh, but it's also uh, an incredible time of opportunity for research and for scientists to go out and understand how our ecosystems will start to bounce back from, start, from disasters like these fires. And this is particularly relevant in a world uh, being increasingly affected by climate change, where severe and widespread fire events like this are only going to become more and more uh, commonplace. But as you can imagine, it's pretty difficult when you have limited funding, a limited time, and obviously a limited number of researchers to be able to cover such a tremendous area all by themselves. So what can we do? Well, we can leverage the amazing ability of citizen scientists. So if you pick uh, any of these areas across New South Wales, there's bound to be some citizen scientist in the area at any given point in time. So what we did was we set up the Environment Recovery Project. So this was a project that was uh, the brainchild of Casey Kirchhoff. Uh, she is an amazing PhD student at UNSW, uh, working on alpine plants and their response to climate change. And she started the Environment Recovery Project. And we basically started bombarding social media and, and traditional media. And we really wanted people to go out into areas that had recently burnt, uh, once it was safe to do so, and start recording uh, which organisms had been badly impacted and uh, which organisms, perhaps more importantly, were starting to come back. And as of last weekend, we have almost 20,000 observations covering more than 3,000 species uh, and being contributed by almost 450 people. And as you can see, there's, there's quite an impressive uh, geographic spread uh, of observations. These cover all the way across New South Wales uh, and Southeast Queensland. So these stretching across the entire New South Wales coast, all the way down into Victoria, 
And the great thing is that we're actually accepting observations now uh, from not just the 2019 to 2020 bushfire season, but we're also accepting observations into the project of any areas that have burnt in the past few years uh, and areas that will burn. So if you do find yourself in an area where uh, you know a bushfire occurred uh, or even a hazard reduction burn has occurred, then by all means, add your observations to the project. They're all very valuable data points. And you can see in addition to the East Coast, we're even getting observations now from Kangaroo Island and around Adelaide, uh, Perth, uh, just south of Perth, uh, the Stirling Range, uh, and up even into the McDonnell Ranges uh, in the Northern Territory. So we've had all kinds of amazing observations being contributed to the project. Uh, for anyone that's unaware of this amazing mollusk, this is the Mount Kapitar Pink Slug. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Red Triangle Slug that's found along the entire East Coast. Uh, this uh, pink slug is in the same genus, and it is endemic to a single volcanic peak in Mount Kapitar National Park in northern New South Wales. And there were great fears that this slug might have been wiped out because the national park was uh, severely impacted, something like 80 to 90% of it burnt during the fires. Uh, but within the space of a couple of months, there were multiple observations of this slug uh, submitted to the Environment Recovery Project, which got everyone very excited. There were some great records uh, showing scavenging by wedge-tailed eagles uh, on wallabies and kangaroos in the immediate aftermath of the fire, uh, as well as one of the, the more famous uh, celebrity species, uh, the pink flannel flower, which came out in the absolute millions. Uh, I certainly uh, went out to the Blue Mountains and, and made sure I got photos. Uh, so this was a really awesome one to see. So we ended up publishing a paper uh, in 2021 uh, this paper was published very rapidly after we first started the project, so we compiled it just a, a few months afterwards. Uh, so all the stats uh, that were in this uh, paper have certainly ballooned and grown exponentially since then. But we were what we were really interested in was not necessarily the individual observations themselves, but looking at the observations from the bigger picture and saying, well, do, will citizen scientists uh, provide an accurate snapshot of fire recovery? And, and the answer really is, is a resounding yes. So we've found that citizen scientists really delivered data on a taxonomically wide range uh, of species. So often, so if you think back to my slides with the seesaws, uh, where we looked at the great imbalance and the great biases towards particular taxa, well, actually, across uh, all the observations in the fire project, you'll see that there's quite a lot of different species. Uh, and you name it, we saw uh, people observed it, fungi, uh, plants, animals, bacteria, protozoans, it was all there, which was, was, was really great to see, especially given for anyone that does look at the literature and a lot of the, the conservation literature in particular that follows bushfires, it tends to really be focused on uh, charismatic vertebrates like mammals, things like koalas, uh, birds and plants. And a lot of the time, the invertebrates really suffer. Uh, so it's good that there was data being contributed uh, across a range of different taxa. We also saw that citizen scientists were really great at actually contributing data across the range of the fires from a, a spatial perspective. So as I mentioned, these data points are actually from all the way back uh, in March uh, or April last year. So if you were to redo this figure now, in fact, all of these gray areas, which represent the fires, they would pretty much be covered by colored points. So it pretty much didn't matter where a fire occurred, there were at least some points showing uh, how organisms were recovering uh, from some citizen scientists. And something that I've mentioned multiple times now as well is that citizen scientists were able to visit the fire grounds literally sometimes in the hours or days after fires had occurred, which was perhaps one of the most valuable outcomes from this project. Because as I mentioned, the researchers can't be everywhere at the same time. So there are many areas where by the time a researcher got to that place and started recording data, it might have been a month, six months, even a couple of years since the fire had occurred there. So to have people there literally in, in the days after was uh, an, an amazing source of data. And, and it allowed us to capture really amazing sightings like this. So this is a, a huge fungus, the fruiting bodies of this particular fungus. Uh, they're perhaps 30 to 40, 40 centimeters across in diameter. And you can see that even in this area, that seems like it got absolutely torched. Uh, there are already signs of life literally in the day or two after these fires had occurred, which is a really cool thing to see. And finally, which was uh, one of the more interesting findings as well, was that citizen scientists actually provided really cool data on the severity of the fires. 
So each time initially when people uploaded observations to the project, we asked them to estimate how severe they thought the fires actually were at that location. So this ranged from the least severe rating from trees with no leaves scorched. So this was essentially fires that only went through the undergrowth uh, all the way up to trees with 100% of leaves consumed. So these were essentially the devastating crown fires where pretty much everything had been destroyed. So you can see here on this figure, the x-axis is uh, scientific data derived from satellites. So these are this is from remote sensing uh, and using temperature basically as a proxy of fire severity with the higher temperatures representing more severe fires. And then on the y-axis, you've got all of our citizen science categories. And you can see there is a pretty nice trend here, which is what, what you would have hoped to expect and what is what we largely saw. There is a little bit of fuzziness up here with estimating the most severe fires, but overall science, uh, citizen scientists provided uh, a pretty good estimate of how severe a fire was. And the reason this is so important is that we can't always use this remote sensing to try and detect how severe fires were. So if you have an area with a lot of cloud cover, the satellites will struggle to uh, record temperatures there. So the fact that we know people can be on the ground and can provide a, a pretty decent estimate of how severe a fire was is really important and useful information for the future. And finally, just to wrap things up before I kind of open to questions, uh, this is a figure that I made for a paper I published last year. And this is, I think, one of the most important figures that I've made in any of the papers that I've written. And what it does is, is it represents the positive feedback loop that exists when experts start to join iNaturalist. So if we can pick somewhere where the, where the cycle first started, we can maybe pick this place, right? So more experts join iNaturalist. So this can be for a number of reasons. This can be because their institutional organization is uh, promoting a lot more people to join iNaturalist and, and is driving them to start contributing to the platform. Or maybe they heard about the platform from one of their colleagues or friends and were, they were interested in checking it out. Or maybe they were specifically recruited to try and um, tidy up the data for a particular group of organisms. But whatever the case, an expert joins the platform. Because they join, more observations get identified thanks to their expertise. And they're able to then teach the citizen scientists uh, how to make those identifications uh, of those organisms. With their new knowledge, the citizen scientists not only then make better identifications themselves now independently of the experts, but they also typically become more and more enthused to make more observations of those particular groups of organisms and to make better observations. Because not only are these experts able to say, okay, you need features X, Y, and Z to identify here, they'll also tell you how to take better photos often and where to find these organisms. So now we have citizen scientists making more and better identifications and more and better observations. In turn, this improves the quality of data across the platform as a whole, which then incentivizes more experts to join our naturalist. Because of course, one of the, the common reasons and justifications you often see for experts not engaging with the platform uh, is often that uh, for some tax or at least, uh, the quality can be somewhat low and, and there are often misidentifications uh, and that's something that can often deter experts from joining. But as the data improves, then the experts are more likely to join our naturalist and engage, which makes the citizen scientists make better observations, which improves the data, which makes more experts join. And you then have this incredible positive feedback loop where more and more experts join and the data quality just keeps getting better and better and better. And iNaturalist just goes from strength to strength. A really cool example that well, I'll wrap up as the last thing I'll mention uh, is, is robber flies. And this is a really cool real world example. So if you go back a, a couple of years, robber flies very rarely got identified to species from an Australian perspective. It was something like 19% of observations uh, got identified to species. And this was really only the, the largest and most charismatic ones that got ID'd. Most of the time that they'd get to subfamily, uh, inevitably most things were subfamily acillinae. I was pretty much disincentivized to observe more robber flies. And I know a lot of people probably felt the same. You know, I would go out, I would see a robber fly and I would think, why waste my time taking photos of this? if I'm going to upload it and no one will ever identify it to species, right? So I essentially stopped taking photos. Then sometime in 2020, uh, a robber fly expert comes along and just starts pumping out thousands of identifications. And in the space of literally a, a couple of weeks, we go from 19% of all Australian robber flies ID to species 
to over 40%. And we went from around 42 species of rubber flies having been uploaded to more than 100. So this just really hammers home the importance of these experts joining. And now that all my observations were suddenly getting retrospectively ID'd, I was suddenly really motivated. I was like, I want to go out and find robber flies and take photos because now I'm really excited because they may well get identified. So my, my last take home message is uh, if you know someone who is, is really great at identifying a group of organisms and they're not on iNaturalist, spread the word, try and persuade them to join uh, and iNaturalist will only be a better place for, for having done so. And, and if you're the expert that really knows how to identify, then jump in there and start identifying things for people uh, and only good things can happen. Thank you very much, Thomas. Yes. We have so a round much. of virtual applause. Yeah, so good. Oh my gosh. Amazing what's possible. People doing so much, contributing so much in such an amazing way. Thomas, can I ask one question? Because that's something that um, Helen, our last presenter, wanted to ask. And that was, and you mentioned this at the, right at the beginning, the interaction between species. And she's particularly interested in looking at what invertebrates eat what Australian native plants. How do we go about recording that data in a sort of ecological way where both species are recognised so we can link them? Yeah, absolutely. So what you can do here is you can make use of observation fields. So there's kind of two main ways that you can add additional metadata and these little extra bits of information on Unnaturalist. One is annotations and one is observation fields. So annotations are restricted to a few prescribed pieces of information. So that's things like life stage. So you can say whether something is a larva or a pupa or an adult and so on uh, for things like a sex, uh, for whether it's dead or alive. Uh, and for what the evidence of presence is. So is it the organism itself or is it a footprint, a feather, scat, a gall, so on. But then you have observation fields uh, for which the uh, options and opportunities are, are boundless. So observation fields are customizable, are creatable. There are already tens of thousands that exist, but if the one that you want doesn't exist, you can add it yourself. And essentially you would just, you would create your observation field. So in this case, there'll be many, many that exist, but pretending this one doesn't exist, you could just call it something like host plant or host plant association or food plant, something along those lines. There are many, many ones that exist along those lines already. So it's just a matter of finding the best one. Uh, and then you would just enter the, the data field that you want. So you could have, have it as a free form answer, or you could have it as a drop down list of particular options or multiple choice. Uh, and then those observation fields get appended to that observation. So there are two ways of doing it. You could either do it for the plant or for the insect. So if you had an observation of a plant and then there happened to be an insect on it, you would add the observation field as the insect name or the other way around. So if you had an observation of an insect uh, and you were looking through lots of observations of insects, you would then probably go through, check what plant it's on and add the name of the plant as the observation field. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually create entire projects that are structured purely around those observation fields so that every time someone adds an observation to your project, uh, they have to fill out that observation field. Uh, and you can also search and filter for observations purely based on that observation field and even for specific values uh, within that observation field. So uh, long, long answer short, uh, observation fields are the way to go for that kind of extra interaction information. That is brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, we're definitely going to work on that and create a project for it. So that's probably the, the most fun way to do it. And yeah, thank you so much. Are there any other questions that we have seen some? I'm just trying to look through the. Yep, there's a couple. I've, I've listed the top four or five here. So first question for Thomas, how do you find projects? Yeah, so just the, the basic search bar. So if you log into iNaturalist and you'll be taken to your home page, uh, up in the top left-hand corner is a big white search bar. Uh, if it hasn't been expanded yet, it looks like a little green magnifying glass. Uh, if you already know the name of the project or you have a, uh, a particular concept or theme in mind, you can start to type it into there and it will show it. Or along the top of your dashboard, there's a specific little menu header which says projects. And then you can go into that and then you can specifically search for any project you like. So just plug in a keyword you could plug, or, or phrase, whether it's something like parrot or nest hollow or caterpillar, 
uh, just plug it in and it will show uh, a big list of all the different projects uh, that are there. So they're very, very easily searchable. So that's that's on the website version though, not the that's, app. That's on the website, yes. I, yeah. And that is a good segue into noting that iNaturalist has both an app and a desktop version. Uh, of, of those options, the desktop version is far superior and what I highly recommend to people because that's where all the functionality is. The app is, is good if you're kind of out in the field on the go and you snap a quick photo of something as you're walking by and you want to upload it. But if you want to do all the really cool stuff, uh, the desktop is the way to go. Cool. Okay. Just a, a quick question though. Is there a push to get data from my naturalist or the LA used in planning decisions? Uh, absolutely. Increasingly so, which is really good to see. So traditionally in the past, from a kind of land management conservation perspective, uh, at least from a New South Wales point of view, Bionet has really been the data that is used. So that, that's the kind of the government portal uh, where you can submit records that end up in the ALA. And that was really all that was used. And, and I know from a few other states as well, it, it was the same thing with their state equivalents. But now increasingly, uh, I've been collaborating with and helping out more people from government agencies and conservation agencies uh, set up projects and understand how to export data from iNaturalist and then actually use that in planning decisions like, should we uh, knock down uh, this area uh, and, and build apartments or are there threatened species here? Or should we drain this dam and, and build a parking lot? Or are we potentially impacting on some rare organism that hasn't been recorded from elsewhere? So the answer is yes. Uh, and it's increasingly uh, being used in these sort of decisions. Uh, and it's something that I'm, I'm really excited about. And I'd just like to add too that um, all of the ALA stuff is is open access. So you can go on there at any time and see what is in that area they want to build a dam on and then have a look and see if anything nearby would be affected. See what sort of actual um, observations are already in ALA. So that's also another, another fun way to, to uh, make your point, if you will. Uh, question three, what is the best way to record many observations of the same species? This is from Libby. Our survey ponds have gone from getting one observation a year of brush tail fascogolies, I can never say that word, to over 100 observation dates per year at six ponds. Is there a good way to record this? Uh, pretty much just taking as many photos as you can uh, <laughs> is, is the best way and, and just getting many as many records. The only kind of restriction you have in this case is that it's kind of one photo, uh, one photo or set of photos of one individual per roughly 24 hours. So if you're out there at night and you see six different individuals, you are more than welcome to upload those as six different observations. But if you were to say, see one individual at six o'clock at night, and then a couple of hours later, you know that you were seeing the same individual, I would probably hold off until the next day to recording it. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's no a uh, real fancy way to do this. It's literally just taking as many photos as you can and uploading as many observations as you can. And, and having that kind of uh, temporal resolution uh, to the data is a really important thing. So it's, uh, people can be a bit tentative sometimes about uploading um, observations of the same species over and over. But if everyone kind of goes in with that mindset, then we actually end up having those species underrepresented. So if, if, some, if you're finding that something is increasing in abundance and it's quite common, then by all means, make more observations to reflect that. And that's a really important thing to do. Okay, I got another one here from Karen. Will iNaturalist eventually make a section for audiovisual observations like a video you make? At present, we can add photos and audio tracks. Yeah, so this is one of the more requested things uh, on the iNaturalist forum. Uh, you can kind technically kind of do it. You can upload GIFs. Uh, so you can actually, if, you, if you've got a video, you can convert it to a GIF and upload it. They tend to be a little bit laggy. Uh, but ultimately, for now, the answer is, is no uh, from my naturalist for videos. It's just uh, the ultimate justification is, is it's too much of a strain on, on resources with obviously the uh, exponential, uh, constantly exponentially increasing number of photos, which are already taking up a tremendous uh, amount. Uh, videos as well would would probably uh, be a little bit too much. So it's a, it's a dodgy solution, but whenever whenever I take videos that I really want people to see, I upload them to my personal YouTube channel and then I just link them in the observation. And it's a, it's not the best solution, but yeah, ultimately for now, I, I don't think we'll see videos being uploadable anytime soon. Thanks, Thomas. I recently had um, 
um, a little frog um, observation that we had and uh, I had a small video and then we ended up making it into a soundtrack with another program and uploading it. The only thing is I can't hear the, uh, the sound sometimes on my um, computer so I don't know if it's coming through and have to rely on others telling me if it's working so that's another reason why I was wondering as well yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, if you if you send me through a message uh, on INAD after this, I'll send you a link to the audio converter that I use. And right. I, potentially, if it's different to yours, I, I use one that I've had really good results with and it usually puts out good audio. Excellent. Thanks for that. I'll do that. Okay. I'm just um, going to ask, I just want to ask another question um, about fungi specifically, because um, there is uh, a very, the, the way mycology is at the moment for recording is very specific with looking, you know, at spores and uh, spore print and all of these things. And I still argue that photos are worth uploading of fungi so that we know what we have in Australia. And even though the AI is still not there, we can train it. Would you agree with that, that it's still very much worth knowing how to take photos and still upload them for future reference? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really important point. So I, I guess there's two things there. One is that uh, you're still going to get fungi that are very recognizable from photos. So you are going to get those common species that don't require all these extra bells and whistles uh, compared to, to other taxa. So it's as one small thing, it's certainly worth uh, uploading those. Uh, but yeah, I think you never know how identifiable something might be from a photo in five or 10 years time. So what seems like now to be a cryptic complex where we're like, okay, there's probably 10 things here. They all look the same uh, morphologically. Uh, we have to do DNA sampling or, or spore prints or something uh, like that. You never know how they might be separated and there might be a really obvious feature, it turns out, once we have enough photos of them. So that's the really important thing is that there are lots of, lots of cases where new color morphs and new uh, patterns are being uploaded on iNaturalist and people are understanding more the variation across species, like the, the infraspecific variation that occurs in certain taxa that previously was unknown to science. Uh, and so certainly, I mean, I, I tend to be a little bit disincentivized with fungi because I know that a lot of the time I upload them, they invariably, it's a struggle to ID them just because there's so much more work to be done taxonomically on fungi in Australia, especially compared to say the Northern hemisphere. Uh, but I, I still upload them and, and yeah, go down a couple of years down the track. It's always a pleasant surprise if someone comes along and identifies something. So uh, I think definitely worth uploading them. And so for people that are looking at fungi, I, I, what I would definitely recommend as a baseline is if you've got a classic mushroom looking thing is taking a photo of the cap from above, uh, making sure you get the gills from underneath. So if you have a little handheld mirror, that can, that can often help with taking photos of the underside of a mushroom. Uh, one from kind of side on, so you can see the stalk as well. And then what's also often really important with fungi is recording what the substrate was. So was it growing on dead wood? Was it on a live tree? Was it coming out of wood chips, uh, leaf litter? So they're one of these groups that it's also important to kind of note what the general habitat and, and other things like that are as well. Absolutely. Thanks. That's great. And yeah, that I really actually... encourage people to, to, to take really good photos of fungi from different perspectives and definitely have our presence there, uh, have the fungi represented and... I think as my, you know, my cross, uh, sorry, photo, photo technology is getting better as well on phones. Like sometimes you'll be, I think in the future we'll be able to record much more detail as well. All right, sorry. That's okay. It stop. just brings segues nicely into my next question, which was what makes a good observation? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> that will probably require another full presentation. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, so I, I would say, I would argue that, potentially any observation is a good observation because it is contributing another data point uh, for that species. And it is telling us a little bit more about its distribution. It is telling us that this species occurred at this point in time, at this particular place. We can then associate things like the weather condition, the environmental conditions, other species it was interacting with. And in any given observation, uh, any one of these points of extra information could be something new that we didn't know about before. But as, a, as perhaps a less of a cop-out answer, uh, I would say uh, high quality photos, uh, just getting as good of photos as you can. So, you know, obviously it's not always possible when you've got fast moving organisms or things that are high up, or if you are only using your phone potentially to take photos, but uh, just getting, so even if you can't get very high quality 
ultra resolution photos, I think one of the most important things for a good observation is getting as many shots as you can as of as many features as you can. So if, if you are taking a photo of a mushroom, the kind of the pitfall that a lot of uh, new people that aren't used to observing fungi will fall into is just taking a photo of the top of the mushroom. When often a lot of the important details are underneath with the gills or if it, if, if it even has gills or not. Uh, so if you're taking a photo of an insect, rather than just getting say one photo from the side, trying to get a photo from above, one of the face, one from behind, uh, if it's safe to pick up potentially a photo from underneath as well, because depending on the group of organisms, that might be the important feature. So as one good example, you've got Christmas beetles. So a lot of the time people will take photos of Christmas beetles from the side or above, and they may not be identifiable because there's a lot of really similar species. But if you are actually able to pick up the Christmas beetle and take a photo of its butt from behind, that's actually one of the most important photos that you can take for some particular species of Christmas beetles. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's a photo that people might not think to take. And the same thing goes for plants. A lot of people will take photos of a tree from 100 meters away uh, and then inevitably be disappointed when it can't be identified. So if you are taking a photo with a plant, try to get everything you possibly can. So a photo of the whole plant in the context of its environment. So you know, okay, it's a shrub or it's a tree or it's a herb. Uh, the bark, the, the top of the leaves, the underside of the leaves, the flowers, the fruits, all the features that you can uh, are important because you never know which of those individual features might be the most important identifying feature for that particular species. So for getting a good observation, as many photos as you possibly can, you can upload up to 20 photos in any given individual observation. Uh, so uh, go, go nuts and upload as many as you can. Uh, and I think also what makes a good observation is if you had an enjoyable experience uh, observing it and if you then learned something. So obviously, yes, go and take photos of all the common things, but also go out there and try and uh, really push yourself and take photos, go to new areas you haven't discovered, uh, you haven't explored yet, and take photos of things that you've, you've never looked at before. Uh, and then some will ID it and you'll have learned something new. And I think in my books that, that makes that a good observation. That's awesome. so cool. Yeah, I, I have, I think one more, if we can, if we, if we can squeeze in one more, what do you reckon, Sandra? Yeah, I think we should. Thomas, you gave me one more. Okay, this, yeah, one's, yeah, from, yeah, this sure. one's from Meredith and I love this one because it's a school project. So she has a project she set up for her school. Is there a way she can use the data offline to improve student knowledge or represent it visually offline? The CSV file is a bit, bit overwhelming. A good question. Uh, so there are a few things. So I can I can send some links to you afterwards, Meredith. There are a, a few little interesting tools that people have created that I have in mind. I just I'm not sure if they're usable offline or not. So they they are certainly tools that aren't in the form of the very daunting CSV. Uh, but there are a whole lot of really cool tools uh, and little extra widgets that people have created for iNaturalists. So there's a there's a flashcard test that someone has created where it will show you a little grid, a four by four grid uh, of four different species. And then you have to pick which one it is, or you can plug in your postcode or your address, and then it'll start to show you photos of species that have been observed near you. Uh, and you can try and identify them. So it's testing how well you know your, your local wildlife uh, and flora. Uh, and there you can actually also create a animated PowerPoint uh, from some projects, uh, which is a, an old feature. Uh, of iNaturalist, which I can dig up and show you how to do. I just have to double check if indeed any of those things can actually be done offline. But certainly from a visual perspective, that is not the CSV, there are a heap of cool tools. Yeah, it's just a matter of whether you actually need the internet to do them or not. But uh, I'll dig into that a bit further for you. That's so cool. Thomas, can we just ask lastly, just about your project and how you're using, um, yeah, for your PhD project, how you're using our natural data and just a little bit more about it because I just find it fascinating. That Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I, I, so my PhD is kind of revolving around uh, species discovery and, and knowledge in Australian plants and not only understanding kind of what the current state of the playing field is in terms of what we know about Australian plants, but then also how we can improve that knowledge. So the, the first big chapter of my PhD that I've been working on right now that is using a lot of iNaturalist data is how many species of Australian plants have ever been photographed uh, and which species have never been photographed. Uh, so I've, I've spent the past couple of months, uh, 
I downloaded every single plant observation from Australia uh, for iNaturalist. And then I looked at about 32 other online databases. Uh, and yeah, basically was just tallying up which species have, have never had photos. And it, it's about 3,700 uh, out of 21,000 odd. So plenty of opportunities uh, for people to go out there and try and find some of these, these rare plants and, and photograph them for the first time and, and upload them to iNaturalist because what we're, the message we're really trying to hammer home is that you know if you're working in conservation or field research in some way and you're trying to protect a plant, if you don't know what it looks like, then how are you able to go out and find it in the field and help protect it? So without you know photos for plants that only have say a photo of a herbarium sheet of an old dried plant from 100 years ago or indeed some plants that have never been photographed at all, uh, it makes it really hard to try and conserve them and to try and uh, record them in the field if we don't know what they look like. So that's why it's so important to go out there and photograph everything that you can because you never know uh, something that you photograph it might be the first time that species has ever been photographed. Yep and I can just imagine how many microscopic creatures need to be photographed as well. A absolutely. So that, that's that's, just from, the plant. that's yeah. just from the plant perspective. So when you start yeah. diving into all the, all the insects and the fungi and the microorganisms, you're getting tens of tens of thousands upon tens of thousands of things that they might be really common, but just no one's ever taken notice yes. of them and taken photos. So that's why it's important to just take photos of as many things as you can and you never know the significance of them. Yeah, And even if it's not getting used, that data will be there, hopefully, for future generations. And I reckon technology will improve and also more people will become excited to be scientists and discover those things. And citizen scientists might have these technologies in the future that will be able to actually do a lot of work with the data that's now being captured. So let's just all capture as much as we can <laughs> and share it because it's exciting to view it online and go through other people's photos. It's just excellent, excellent tool. Whoever made it is a genius. Thanks so much, Thomas, for just, being just so great with it. One more, <laughs> sorry, can we grab one more? Just one, one quick question, Thomas, another person on here also called Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Uh, just wants to know, is there a way to incorporate local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people names for species at local areas? Uh, yeah, there is. So uh, any user is able to uh, add new names uh, for species, new common names. So all you have to do is uh, search up that species. Uh, you go, go to its main profile page and then you can go down and you can click add a name and you can include the local name uh, and then you can uh, specify what language it's in. And then you can even set that name to be a priority uh, for a certain area. So I can, and so yeah, if you, if you message me afterwards, uh, I can show you exactly how to do that. But uh, the answer is definitely yes, you can add those names. Excellent, thank you. Is the best way to contact you through iNaturalist, Thomas? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you can feel free to message me on iNaturalist. I'm just the beach coma, so you can search my name and then directly message me, or you can feel free to email me as well. Uh, it's just my full name at gmail.com. If you look up, if you look me up, the beach coma, I've got my e both my emails on my profile on iNaturalist. So certainly feel free to, anyone who has any questions iNaturalist related or otherwise, feel free to message me at any time. That's really generous of you. Thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. It's been great having you online with us. And Thomas, good luck with your have the best fun ever on the West Western Australia trip. Hopefully we'll get to hear about it somehow. <laughs> Probably see photos on iNaturalist. Yep. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for supporting us. Do a survey at the end. Um, we will send a survey out and we really hope you get to do it because it gives us some feedback on, this, um, on these presentations. And we're going to close now. So good night. Have a nice rest and see you next time. And just a reminder that we will be having another one of these in a couple of months' time. Yes. Um, we're looking at currently we have a few options on the table, but if there's anything in particular you'd like to see, please post it in the chat now. These will always be free. So keep an eye on our, on our Acts of Facebook page, et cetera, for the events. And, yes, thank you very much, uh, The Beachcomber. Thanks. Good night.